Moshe Kasher is a comedian, writer, and actor who can be found on Instagram at Moshe Kasher. You can hear him on his podcast, The Endless Honeymoon, that he hosts with his wife, Natasha Legero, and check out his brand new book. It comes out on Tuesday, January 30th. It's called Subculture Vulture, a memoir in six scenes. And if you're here in Austin on Tuesday, January 30th, his first book event will be at Book People at 7 p.m. that night. It is moderated by fellow comedian Duncan Trussell. Go to bookpeople.com for tickets and more info. Moshe, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? My pleasure. Thank you. I'm good. I'm really good. I'm excited. Today was a good day in the world of Moshe Kasher. Good review in the New York Times. Good review in the San Francisco Chronicle. I am feeling good. Excellent. Well, congratulations on that. And I understand the rave reviews. I loved this book. First Thank off, you. the premise behind the book of these uh, epiphanous moments or things or aspects of your life that have helped to define who and what you are as a person to this day is a brilliant concept. And I think it's just a, a great dinner question for people that are getting together. And uh, you not only talk about your own experiences with this these things, but you also provide some history lessons along the way as well. Uh, what was the genesis of the idea for this excellent book, Moshe? Uh, well, I, you know, I wrote another book in uh, 10 years ago or something about my kind of childhood drug addiction days. I was in and out of rehab like three times by the time I turned 15. And uh, it ends like the day that I that I get clean. And over the years, a lot of people have asked me, like, what happened next? And uh, the answer is everything else. You know, I, I, I really thought at the end of the state that I was in at the end of my first book, I thought that my life was over and it really had kind of just begun. So I kind I walked through this world figuring out like what life had in store for me like I'd been saved from the jaws of a shark that I had created myself and uh, I sort of stumbled into these magical universes that created me and uh, this book is like yeah it's one part history and it's one part comedy and one part memoir and one part love letter to the 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 the, the worlds that have made me and those six worlds that you focus on are AA. Raves. That's right. AA and raves, you know, everybody, those go together really easy. AA and raves, everybody that goes to AA long enough has to go to a rave. It's mandated. Well, then Burning Man and stand-up comedy also, for being completely honest about things, although there are plenty of stand-up well, comedians who have gotten sober over time. But then also deafness, and then uh, your Jewishness, I guess, is uh, the way that I'll put it. You say the Jews in the uh, the title of the chapter where you... Yeah. Uh, Sounds better when I say the Jews, right? It it sounds a, a little bit softer. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm Armenian. We're considered the uh, the poor man's Jews, but uh, I still. Think oh. <laughs> that, but you have the uh, the carte blanche on that term. So let's start on the AA well, look, side of things. Uh, yeah, go for it. Why did AA start clicking for you at the age of 15, which is when you got sober, which is obviously much earlier than many people who ultimately do get sober from whatever the substance addiction is. Well, I come from uh, the just say no, dare rehab generation, as I call it in the book. You know, I I was of a generation where when you started getting in trouble, the kind of knee jerk reaction was to send kids to rehab. And uh, and, you know, in some ways I was a, a beneficiary of it. In some ways I was a victim of it. My mom started sending me to therapy when I was four, not for drugs, but for other stuff. And when I started to have substance stuff going on, the the natural, my mother believed in therapy the way pe- people believe in religion, you know? So at a certain point in my life, I was in therapy eight times a week. That's more times than there are days, but we were doubling up quite a few of those days. And um, so I guess I was lucky enough that when I, my teenage substance stuff started to really get out of control. I was kind of already in AA. I was already in a 12 step world because I'd been forced to go to rehab and meetings as a result of the rehab since I was like, you know, 14. And um, I was lucky that when I needed help, I was already physically in the space where I could turn around and ask for that help. And there was, I was lucky that somebody was there to give it to me. So AA obviously involves the 12 steps and one of those steps, maybe the most known step is making amends. Was there a hardest apology for you as you were working your way through that step? You know, there's this concept in the 12 steps um, and, you know, just to be 
fair to the listeners, like this book is about uh, th this section is about like how AA saved my life and reconfigured me. But it's also about when I get older, uh, you know, 15, 20 years into it, and it starts to feel like it's slipping through my fingers. I, I am still sober. Um, but but AA itself created these sort of existential questions as I got older, like, was this a phase? Was I what what was it that was happening to me? You know, it was a, which was also a part of my journey was that struggle. But with the ninth step and, and the truth is, despite the fact that I don't know if I could say I'm in AA anymore, um, I still definitely live my life according to a lot of the principles that I got there. And the biggest I think the biggest wisdom in the ninth step is that, yes, yeah, sometimes it's about going up to someone and saying, I'm sorry, I hurt you. How can I make it right? But just as often, if not more often, it's about living your life in a different way and like fixing, fixing the, the harm that you have done. You know, what they say like a, the trust bucket fills up a drop at a time, but it only takes one kick to knock the whole thing over. So when I got sober, I put that bucket up right. And with my family, my, my mom in particular, who was like my, my champion and my, and my uh, adversary through a lot of my drinking, um, it's been a, a, a long and really meaningful uh, repair. When you did find yourself in that existential crisis 15 years into sobriety, 15 years into your relationship with AA, how much of it had to do with the dogmatism that existed within AA? Because you, as you point out, and it's very true, AA is its own special form of religion in a lot of ways. In AA, they say we are, we're spiritual, not religious. But you, then you look up the, the definition of spiritual in the dictionary and it says relating to religion. So I don't really know what that what that means. There is dogma in AA and I and it's a soft dogma, you know, and it's one that uh, it's one that its primary principle. Uh, and like I said, this is as much a love letter as a goodbye letter. Um, its primary principle, I think, is to lower the bar to make like to, to make the dogma a low enough bar that kind of anybody can leap over it because AA is in the business, I think, of saving lives to the degree that it can. So this isn't an attack on it. It's more of a, a, a description of the of the the path that I had to walk in it. Um, and part of that was uh, was dogma based. And part of that was just the, my own kind of journey. Like I said, like when you get sober that young, it's impossible to not have the thought 15 years later, like, was that what I thought it was? Or has it like every other part of my life changed? Um, and, uh, and that's some of the questions that I that I grapple with in that section in the book. It's so interesting, because you did it so long ago now, and you've obviously matured a ton since then. It, it, do you wonder if you can have a drink and be okay with that? Or are you okay with just not touching the stuff for the rest of your life? Well, you know, it's like, I've got this really good life. And it's hard to really make a case that malt liquor would add to it. By the way, the fact that I'm referencing malt liquor as a 44 year old man, that should show you all you need to know about whether I should drink again. <laughs> it should be, I should have said cognac or Pinot Noir. And you know, I got a family now. I, I have a daughter and I've got this great life and this great career and a great wife. And, uh, and so the risk assessment, it, you know, when I was 15, I was like, just worried about like survival. Now I got this, uh, you know, I got this mortgage to pay. So I don't know if, uh, I don't have any plans on drinking again, but the future, uh, who knows what happens. As you said a few minutes ago, nothing goes with sobriety like raves. And that is the second scene that you cover in subculture vulture. And uh, you went to your first rave in 1995 after getting sober. Why were you never the same after that very first rave? A change that you call instant and extreme. You know, there's some of these worlds that I talk about, deafness and Judaism. These are worlds that I was sort of born into. But but a lot of these worlds are things that I, it's like I describe the the books that I loved reading as a kid, like the Narnia book or, or like um, uh, uh, Harry Potter is like this. It's Star Wars to some degree, which is like, it's about this like person who thinks that they're weak and thinks that they have no power and has no people and has no friends and has no... Uh, no future. And then they walk through, somebody taps them on the shoulder and says, walk through this door. And they walk through and all of a sudden they're in a different world. And not only are they in that world, they're like a powerful force inside of that world. And like, that is totally what happened to me in raves. Um, you know, when I was 15, I got sober. And then at about nine months sober, I started to realize like, oh, this is the rest of my life. Like I'm sober now and I better figure out how to have 
a life outside of the kind of violence and addiction cycle that I was in when I was a, when I was a teenager. So I can kind of choose my own adventure. And that's what this this book is really is about that adventure. And I went to a rave. I didn't know anybody that went to raves. That was uh, that was for white boys. And, I, and that that's not me. I mean, it is me. But I really didn't think it was me when I bought that first ticket to a rave. And I went by myself. And I remember I brought a weapon to the party just in case, you know, and never you just never know. But it wasn't much of a weapon. It was a bottle of escape cologne stuffed into a sock that I would kind of like spin around like a potpourri scented blackjack. <laughs> I mean, this is the mind. This is the mind I brought with me into that first party. And I walked into that party. And like you said, extreme instant. I remember I dropped the bag on the ground that had the escape uh, weapon in it. Never saw it again. Stopped wearing escape. Uh, walked in and just saw this like throbbing mass of people and this music. And and I was like a, 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 a reborn person. And like, I'm not unaware that raves elicit a bit of an eye roll, you know, it's not, you don't usually think like therapeutic breakthrough when you think um, EDM party. But for me, it was this like, I don't know, have you ever been to a rave? You look like you might've. Yeah, it's been a while, of course, but yeah, I, I, you and I are very similar age. Yeah, I was in, I was at some raves in the nineties. Yeah, you know, like the pacifiers and the stuffed animals and the glow sticks and the glitter and the barrettes that people used to wear, like, that was for me exactly what I needed. I came from this childhood where I, I missed the childhood because I was busy getting arrested and going to mental institutions and rehab. It was like the opposite of a childhood. And then all of a sudden I had this second chance at, a, at, a, at an artificial childhood where I'm dancing around with people that love each other. And yes, hooking up, that didn't happen a lot. That doesn't happen a lot in childhood. So this was, it's actually more fun than childhood. I got to have the innocent uh, hyperbaric chamber of childhood, but. I also got to get laid, so that's always fun. Well, I'm just impressed with the fact that you could enjoy a cuddle puddle and not be on ecstasy. <laughs> well, I, the truth is, and I know this sounds hard to believe, but like, I was high. I mean, I was sober. I was clean and sober. But there was something about that universe where I, I just got high on on the on the people that were there and on the music and on the dancing, and that led me to, like I said, I wanted to not just be a a member of the of the rebellion. I wanted to lead the rebellion. I wanted to be a Jedi Knight. So I very quickly became a, a rave promoter and threw parties all through the 90s in San Francisco. A DJ, I used to, I, I played at uh, hundreds of, of raves in, in the 90s. And eventually, more darkly, the uh, maybe the world's first clean and sober ecstasy dealer. <laughs> That's right. But the natural high is a legitimate thing. I mean, people talk about the runner's high and the release of cannabinoids and uh, the release of oxytocin. Nobody talks, but nobody talks about the raver's high. I mean, now that's I something like we need to discuss. There's something maybe going on with the breath work and the dancing and the cuddle puddles. I'm not totally sure. Maybe if uh, raves make sure. a comeback in 2024, because everything does come back around full circle. Some researchers will go to raves, uh, perhaps as sober as you were back in the day, but you did eventually burn out on this world too, after several years. What, what caused you to kind of leave the rave world behind? Well, there was this, um, this thing happens when you try to become the king or the prince or royalty or just a professional. Uh, and I'm sure you know this working in your industry, like the minute you pass over that invisible line between um, fan to professional, the thing starts to reveal its ugliness to you. And uh, and you could have stayed innocent. You could have and you could have stayed uh, in, in a blissful state of unawareness by just staying a participant. But that started to happen to me in the rave thing. Um, I was working for this guy in the scene in San Francisco and uh, I was his number two man, but he didn't pay me like a number two man. He paid me more like a, a bottom bitch. You familiar with that phrase? <laughs> it's like the, I was like his most trusted prostitute, but I didn't get paid, you know. And then we threw this big party uh, where uh, a bunch of people broke down the fence and snuck. You know, they were I remember I was they were they were pushing on the fence like it was a U.N. refugee camp, you know, and they were going, let us in, let us in. And I was screaming like, guys, guys. Plur, plur, that plur is the rave credo, which is peace, love, unity, and respect. But uh, I was like, remember, plur, everybody. And then they broke the fence down. It came collapsing and like 300 ravers ran at me. I guess they didn't remember plur. But um, I, that party lost tens of thousands of dollars. And my like rave mentor kind of disappeared into the hills. My DJing career dried up. You know, when I first started going, I was 16. 
And by the time I stopped, and, and I was the youngest person there. And by the time I stopped, I was probably, you know, 22. And I was, everybody was 16. And it was like, I don't want to be Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused. It's time to, uh, it's time to move on. But there was a very funny moment that happened. I, I was, I was a DJ and it was DJ Moshe. And I was all over all these flyers for years and years. And I saw, as I was thinking about leaving and thinking, do I belong here anymore? I saw this flyer uh, and there was a DJ at this part, rave coming up called DJ E Moshe. I go, E Moshe? That's, you can't just add an E to my name and then become, that. I can't be E Mick Jagger and go down to Altamont and just play a, a set for the fellas. Like, so I go to the rave with armed with all these um, rave flyers that I'd been on over the years. And I find the guy, I go, are you E Moshe? He's like, yep, that's me. I go, well, I'm Moshe. And look, I'm mean, here I am at this party and this party and this party goes, oh, cool. I go, no, not, I'm it, Moshe. Why did you call, is your name, are you Jewish? Is your name Moshe? He goes, no, I'm not Jewish. I just thought it sounded cool. I go, yeah, it sounds cool. It's my cool name. And he's like, I go, you got to change your name. And he just goes, no. I go, what do you mean? No. He's like, I'm not, no. I go, well, I'll, I go, I'll battle you for it. We, yeah, we'll do like a electric boogaloo style throwdown and we'll let the crowd decide. And he goes, mm, no, I think I'll just keep the name. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm stuck. I'm like, well, I get, I could either beat you to death or give up. And that's what I did. I packed my rave flyers and walked out. Here's the crazy part. I never saw him on another flyer. I, I never, I, I don't know for sure if he was a real person or just a guardian angel sent down to get me to leave the rave scene and my DJing career behind. Oh, wow. I love the idea of a DJ off. And unfortunately, he didn't take you up on that. I feel like you would have won that because he was a first timer and you had done so much work over the years to establish yourself. But he had the power of the heavens behind him. So he might have bested me. Here's a, another interesting factoid, though, is as I wrote the rave chapter, I, start, I was listening to old 90s mixtapes the entire time. And at the end of it, I thought, you know, I think I'll have a benign midlife crisis and i bought a dj controller and i started playing records again or whatever they are now mp3s again for the first time in 20 years all right that's cool bringing an old passion back that's healthy right it, it's better than cheating on your wife and getting a corvette that's what i say <laughs> oh man the third chapter is deafness and this has to do with the fact that you grew up in a deaf family my mother and father, my half sister, half brother, stepsister, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody, everybody surrounding me was deaf. My, my brother and I were the two hearing kids in a sea of deaf people. And as a result, we spoke sign before we talked. I was a sign language interpreter for 15 years. And, um, and I got, I got like a, a real, a real blessing, uh, like a real benefit of being, it's, I, I describe it almost like you're born white in Wakanda. You know, it's like I was born into the, into the world but I was also the adversary of the world. I was a member of the community, but I was also represented the people that had oppressed that community. And it gave me this really unique perspective on the world. I never realized that deaf people have a certain social aloofness about them, like uh, being unabashed farters. And as yes. you, you grew up in a household that was devoid of sexual hangups. What do you mean by that? Well, that has nothing to do with deafness, by the way. That's just as a result of being raised with a hippie mom in the Bay Area. But my mom, I would say, uh, the, uh, well, we had sex ed talks every Tuesday night. It was boys and sex. My mother was a single mom, and she would gather us around the table and read to us from this book as we just turned absolutely crimson in humiliated embarrassment. And then at the end, she would always ask us the same question. Are you, are you guys gay? And we got the impression that it wouldn't have just been okay if we were gay. It would have been much preferred. So that's the, the, um, that, that was the, the world that I was raised in. Very hippie, very open, a lot of uh, uh, nude interpretive dancing in American Sign Language. That's kind of the universe. When my mom um, found out that I was, uh, you know, when I hit puberty and my mom found out I was looking at porn, she brought, she rather than scold me, she brought me to a feminist erotica bookshop uh, to buy me. And she said, you can pick from any of the lesbian text-based erotica because she wanted to make sure that if I was looking at porn, it would have like 90 pages of expository prose poetry before we got to the good stuff. So that's my mom. How do you feel like the American education system has failed deaf people, Moshe? I think we're on an upward trajectory, but there was a movement in the 18... The story of sign language is wild. Uh, 
prior 320 years ago, there was no sign language. I mean, there was sign language, but there was no recognized sign system. If you were born deaf into a family and you were the only deaf person born into that family, you were screwed because there was nobody to teach you language and there was no language for you to learn. Uh, if you were born deaf, you would just be able, uh, you would just be reduced to whatever gestures you and your family came up with uh, to figure out how to say pass, pass the mashed potatoes. But if you were lucky enough, to have genetic deafness in your family and you're you were born deaf and your sibling was born deaf then the two of you could invent a language a language of two a, a language traded back and forth between siblings a little microcosmic language and it, a, a priest the abbe de, de Epe in france in the 1700s saw two sisters like that signing back and forth to each other and he looked at what they were doing and he recognized instantly that is language and he told them, teach me what, you, what you're doing, teach me to sign. He wanted them to teach him to sign so that he could teach them French so that they could uh, take the, the catechism and they could be saved. They could, they could go to heaven, which does, I think, I think we can all agree, make sense that uh, if you can't say the catechism, God's not going to let you into heaven. He's like, listen, I'm God, but if they could say it, I mean, I, I would let him in, but what am I supposed to do, learn sign language? So whatever, that was the mission. And they taught him sign language and he taught them french and he established the first school for the deaf in france where then he started to gather deaf from around france and they started to create this sign system and the first sign system was french sign language and it created this system of deaf people teaching the deaf the priest would teach the deaf uh, uh french and he and he learned sign language and they would go around france and they would do these expositions it would be like a guy uh, an audience member would ask a question like some French question like you know how many creams is too many creams for a brie or uh, you know what is the degree of suffering that can be borne by man and the 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 priest would sign it the deaf student would um, would understand it and write and write on the chalkboard in French the answer that three creams um, so all life is suffering and the French people would like lose their minds right it was like a circus one of those students was Laurent Clerc and he was a genius. And when Thomas Gallaudet came from America, he said to Laurent Clerc, come with me to America and we can start a school and a science system in America as well. They sailed to America. By the time they landed, Gallaudet knew some sign, Clerc knew English. They set up a school for the deaf. They created American Sign Language. And so from those two sisters to that priest, to that school, to French Sign Language, to Gallaudet, to, to Laurent Clerc, to my mother, to me, this is how I learned language. And this is the story of the free of freedom uh, for the for the deaf community. But almost as soon as they created this free, freedom language, uh, hearing people came along and said, let's stop letting them sign and let's teach them how to talk. And that system, it's called the or oralism, that system uh, was an imposed kind of darkness on the deaf community for a hundred years until they found their own liberation and overthrew that kind of uh, oppression and took their world back. And why do you cherish the 15 years that you spent as an ASL interpreter, a sign language interpreter? Well, this is my, uh, all of these are, but, but deafness, these are my people. And, uh, you know, they, they are, I am a member of that community as a child of deaf adults. And so to work in that world and see the heights the deaf people um, are, can get to, I interpreted for graduate school, the discussions, I, um, I interpreted for PhD graduations where deaf students were getting their doctorate and all the way down to um, uh, interpreting for uh, immigrants who came to America and were learning sign language, but had never or were adults and had to learn it in their 30s, didn't know the sign system of their own country, didn't know the language of their own country, didn't know English. I've interpreted for welfare SSI meetings and uh, I've interpreted for end of life care and horny ki horny people trying to hire sex workers. I've interpreted for it all and I've been able to see like the full spectrum and how important language is and how uh, how powerful this community is. The next scene is Burning Man. Never been to Burning Man. I've just heard about Burning Man. You write early on in this chapter, Burning Man is more awful and more awesome than most people who have never attended and many who have could imagine. How is it both at the same time? Well, it's the biggest spectacle that you will ever see in your life. I mean, it is the wildest party. To, still, 
it's gotten much less wild. The first year I went, people were people, somebody was dead before we started the event. There were drive-by shooting ranges. There was, I mean, just mayhem, uh, lighting buildings on fire on the raw desert in the middle of like a, a national nature preserve. It was a, a mess, shit everywhere. There weren't anywhere near enough porta potties to deal with the rectums of seven thousand participants. But now we're at eighty thousand participants, and lots more porta potties, lots more rules, lots more safety. Uh, but still the most wild and extreme thing I see all year long. Still, it has the ability to make your jaw drop and ask yourself this question, like, what did I just see? And that question to me is where the magic of Burning Man is. So the fifth scene is the uh, aforementioned chapter title, The Jews. And there's a part of this chapter that I was fascinated to read your philosophies on, let's just say, whether Jews or white people. I think you make some great points uh, throughout this, and you call it an ethno-religion. That means it encompasses both an ethnic identity and religious belief. Why do you call your relationship with Judaism one of skeptical affection, Moshe? You know, somebody described it as uh, eat the fish, not the bones, you know? And I feel like that is the uh, that is the relationship with religion. If you want any relationship with religion, and I also can understand not having one at all, that's the healthy version. Fundamentalism has a problem, which is that if you are a fundamentalist believer, that means everyone else in the world is wrong. And I don't wanna live like that. I'm not interested in living like that, where everybody that doesn't believe what I believe is incorrect about everything that they believe. That just doesn't have an appeal to me. But finding the good parts, finding the, the, the fish, you know, where the, where, where the nutrients are, um, to me, that is, that's a, a, a cultural identity that is, uh, that is sustainable. Um, and yeah, are Jews white people? I want to say like that came from Whoopi Goldberg. You, you, I don't know if you remember Whoopi Goldberg saying this, like uh, the, the, the Holocaust was white on white crime. And it was such an interesting conversation because in American, the American view of Jews is because most American Jews are from European descent. There can be this conversation, but so many Jews are Ethiopian or Yemenite or, or, or uh, Moroccan or Tunisian or they're not. So it's a very American centric question, this thing. And also it's a very modern question because Judaism is such an old religion that it comes from a time when there was no separation between your ethnicity and your religion. If you were born in you know, the, the ancient Israel, then you were a Jew because you lived there. If you were born in Greece, ancient Greece, well then you worshiped the God who turned into a swan and had sex with teenagers. That was just the way it was. But now we have this different relationship with religion, which is you, choose your belief system, which I think is in many ways uh, really uh, probably a healthier system, but it leaves a, a, an ethnic religion like Judaism with a translation problem. And uh, that's why you have Jews that are like not religious at all, but still very culturally Jewish because we're, it's more than a religion. Um, and yeah. Well, I remember first being introduced to the idea that race is a social construct sev several years ago. And, and I scoffed at that notion at the time, but uh, the further I get away from the introduction of that idea, the more I realize that there's a lot of truth behind it. Like I told you at the start of this conversation, I'm more Armenian than anything else. Nobody would be able to guess that though. I don't look anything like a Kardashian to, uh, to, to maybe be right. a little stereotypical. You do to me. You do it to me. It is my people though. So okay. I can be stereotypical yeah. like that. <laughs> but race really does come down to how accurately you can predict somebody's ethnic makeup. And I think the idea of Judaism yes. and how many different types of people are Jewish is a great example of that. Well, yeah, I mean, when you have this conversation, I know this is like a radioactive topic in life is about white privilege. They're not really talking about the privilege of being Caucasian. It's about being able to interact in society in a certain way, to get in certain places, to be looked at in a certain way. And that's what's so confusing, I think, to people, especially in America, about Jews and other groups too, by the way. I mean, this was true of the Italians originally. This was true of, uh, I think it is true to some degree for some Armenians, like you, you kind of are both looking, you look like the, us and you also are of a different thing. And, uh, and I think that like the, this whole notion that that the imperative in America is to lose the different thing and become melting pot culture. I think, you know, I get where it comes from. It's a lot like AA. It was designed with something in mind 
to be helpful. Well, let's all go to America and become this like stew. But it also had this this negative effect of making our rituals and our our uh, our culture uh, feel much more uh, of a mo of a modern time and much less grounded in history. Well, I fall into a category of people that believes we'll truly be able to embrace one another's differences. We can laugh about things, which is where I think something like comedy is so important, which is the sixth and final scene that you write about. And I love at the very beginning of this, because look, as a fan of stand up, I'm guilty of calling it this probably way too much for people's comfort. Uh, you can tell insecure comics are about stand up as an art by how often they feel the need to refer to it as an art. Where does that insecurity come from, Moshe? I have a very specific theory on where the insecurity of, of, of comics saying we're artists comes from. And it's because when we started, we really kind of weren't artists, you know, like we really were truly just like almost the guy that shovels the elephant shit between acts at the circus, you know, like that's where we come from. We were at like a burlesque show and a lady, you know, uh, on a unicycle would come and juggle and then she'd hobble off the stage and we'd come on, tell a few jokes in between acts. And then we got into like radio and um, from the burlesque and vaudeville scene came radio. And then every single comedian was doing this thing where you were like, it's the Borax detergent hour coming up next, a comedy sketch. It's all about Borax and how it can get your whites whiter. Well, that's not very artful. And not only that, but every comedian, you know, comedians I'm sure you've seen are very, um, weird and jealous about uh, uh, joke thievery. That's one of our big anxieties, right? I got a theory about that too. Joke thievery was in baked in the sausage in the early days of standup. In the early days of standup, a lot of people, this isn't really my theory, this Cl Cliff Nesteroff who wrote a great book called The Comedians introduced me to this idea, which is all these comedians borrowed a material from each other. Abbott and Costello, when they blew up with Who's On First, there was like 10 other people that did Who's On First and it wouldn't matter because you were, uh, you know, you were, I was in St. Louis and you were in Iowa. Who cares? Who Are you doing who's on first in Iowa? Great. I'll do it in St. Louis. But all of a sudden when Abbott and Costello did it on the radio and it became thought of as an Abbott and Costello bit, everybody started freaking out. Wait, we tell that. Now we can't tell that anymore. So that, that open source kind of, that advertisement and open source origin story of stand-up comedy when stand-up evolved into original material from your own perspective and uh, more of a sort of punk rock thing, I don't do this for the money, we still had this like lingering PTSD from these years where people were like, oh, everybody has the same material. Oh, the only reason we're doing this is because, you know, uh, Hormel Chili will give us a, a advertisement. And so now here we are in the modern era where, where stand-up is definitely obviously art, you know, some, I mean, some more than others. But we have this anxiety where we want to like prove like, hey, we're artists, we're artists. And as I say in the book, I go, you don't hear a lot of sculptors calling what they do art. It's like, yeah, we know Rodin. That's a great answer there. Thank you for that. And you find yourself wondering why stand up is enjoyable. So why do you enjoy it like you do? Well, it is funny because I always look at stand up. One of the things I love about it, when I'm driving to a gig, I think about people in bands all the time. I'm just like, what hell it would be to be in a band where you're like packing a drum and an amp and a bass and a, I'm just, it's just me. I'm the show. I get out and I go up on stage and then the show's over. I don't understand how anybody wants to see stand up. It's just some person talking about things they were thinking about. It seems like it, there are circuses out there and plays. I don't know if people know about this. They're, they have those and they're really big. Uh, but there's something about stand-up, even as simple and analog as it is, that is at an advantage to every other art, which is it's it just is funnier. It's funnier than any... I love romantic comedies. I love comedy movies. I don't... I laugh four times during a great movie. You go to see a stand-up and you don't laugh every four seconds, that stand-up's having a very bad night. So that's the power to me of stand-up is, is in nothing else. It's not about... Uh, being a philosopher, sometimes it is. It's not about uh, offending people, sometimes it is. It's not about speaking truth to power, sometimes it is. What it really is about is giving people a night where they are laughing more than they could laugh at anything else. And I feel like that has its own value to just be able to elicit an, an involuntary joy response from an audience. I think that has its own value and is, and, and is art. Sure, I'll say it. It's an art form. And I love how you also say stand up isn't necessarily about where you can see it. It's uh, it's whether you can fail and keep on going. That's so important with so many different things in life. 
And stand up is a great equalizer. You could have somebody who is known as a great comedian. If they tell a joke that's in its infancy, it will fall flat with the audience. There may be a few morons in the crowd who laugh just because they think that that's where they're supposed to laugh. But anybody who's thinking about what's being said is just going to sit there and wait for the funny part to actually be spoken. Yeah, yeah, completely. And I think like failure, yeah, you're right. It's not just a stand up thing. If that just happens to be the world that I live in, um, failure is such a essential component to uh actually making a career happen like the idea that everything should be success and everything should be positive it's so unrealistic in stand-up that's for sure i mean every every stand-up from my generation did 10 a 10-year internship before we started making money at all and that gives you i think the thick skin although i don't know how thick my skin is i hate it. i hate a negative online comment but it gives you the thick skin to kind of keep going and if you can keep going long enough if you're talented and motivated uh, I, I think that you make it. Now, what make it means, it doesn't always mean you sell out a stadium. What make, what make it means is I, I pay the rent, I feed my daughter just by telling jokes. All right, last thing, Moshe. I spoke with your wife, Natasha, last weekend prior to her headlining sets at Cap City Comedy Club. Uh, shortly after that, she decided to go viral by uh, doing something pretty gutsy <laughs> following Burt Kreischer on stage. Uh, is that something she uh, gave you a heads up on? And uh, what did you think of uh, when, when you saw it play out on video? What do you think I thought? Do you, have you heard about my mother? I didn't care at all. I was just like, oh yeah, this reminds me of my mom. This reminds me of the old days with the ASL interpretive dance. I don't care. Yeah, she took her shirt off at a club. It was very funny. I thought it was very punk rock and very cool. And honestly, like the world is careening in, into meaninglessness so quickly. Like anything you can do to shake up the, uh, the banality of reality, I, I'm all for it. I learned that at Burning Man too. Uh, anytime you can jam the culture just a little bit, uh, it just it, it, it makes life more interesting. That's what I want. And I think that's what this book is about is is my life has been my religion. Yeah, I'm Jewish, but my religion really is like fun. I want to like drink all of life. I want to like so I want to squeeze the towel out. But it's I want by the time I'm like shuffling off this mortal coil to be like I did all the things I wanted to do. And this book is about the the things that I did that made my life worth living and made me who I am today. Completely agreed. He is Moshe Kasher, comedian, writer, and actor. Follow him on Instagram at Moshe Kasher. Check out his podcast yeah. with Natasha, The Endless Honeymoon, and get the new book. It comes out this Tuesday, Subculture, Vulture, a memoir in six scenes. If you're here in Austin on Tuesday, January 30th. He's going to be doing his very first book event at Book People. Of course, the independent bookstore in town. Duncan Tressel is going to be moderating that conversation. Should be a lot of fun. Moshe, thank you so much for the time today, man. Congratulations on the book and best of luck with things in the future. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. Talk to you next time. Books on Pod.